Hello Dutty Humans, welcome back to the channel. And in today's video, we will be conquering finger clubbing for your clinical exam, including how to assess finger clubbing confidently at the bedside in a matter of seconds. And I'll be sharing what I think is the best way to memorize the causes of clubbing so that you never forget and shine on exam day. And we will be answering the question, which common lung condition is not associated with finger clubbing and should spark more investigation? All of that coming up in today's video. So finger clubbing shows up everywhere in your clinical exam, right? It's in your cardiac exam, your respiratory exam, gastrointestinal, and even the thyroid examination. In just about every short case you do in your exam, you're going to be looking for this clinical sign. And it's an important little sign because unless it's hereditary or idiopathic, it usually accompanies an underlying pathology. And so finding finger clubbing should spark further consideration of the causes of clubbing in that patient. But clubbing, as you know, has a spectrum of presentations from early to advanced. So in terms of those stages of clubbing, these are important because they are going to shape how we look at this at the bedside in terms of our clinical skills, right? We're going to look for all the different stages. So stage one is when the nail bed changes. It feels a little bit more spongy. Maybe the nail rocks a little bit easier and it might become red around that area. Stage two is when the angle of the nail changes, kind of taking more of a downward slope. Stage three is when the finger expands in this direction, up and down. So the fingertip actually gets a bit chunkier. And stage four is when the finger expands laterally. So you get that drumstick appearance. And stage five, I mean, does there really have to be a stage five? Stage five is glossy nails and skin. I mean, I don't know if they'd put some Vaseline on. Maybe that doesn't count, right? We're probably clinically only going to be assessing the first few stages. So stage four, advanced clubbing, is when the patient has those big drumstick fingers, which are pretty easy to see at the bedside, right? We can all detect those from a distance. But I'm sure you can appreciate how the earlier signs of clubbing relating to the nail bed and the nail angle and the depth of the fingertip are a little bit more tricky. So we are going to examine these aspects in a hot minute, but just quickly before we do that, if you are studying for your clinical exam, I need you to know about the incredible clinical exam playlist that we have right here on the channel on YouTube. We already have a whole playlist dedicated to long cases and I'll be building out the short case side more as the season continues this year. So be sure to hit that subscribe button and stick around so you don't miss a trick. And even if you're not studying for your exam, I don't know about you, but I think clinical skills can always, you know, have a little bit of a refresher type thing. So let's examine for finger clubbing using these stages. I'll just go straight to the angles. So I'm going to show you two ways to assess the angles in finger clubbing. And the key thing here is to really make a show of it, right? We really want the examiners to know that we looked for the clubbing in this patient, right? So the first one that you're probably very familiar with and doing already is Shamroth sign. That's when we bring the patient's fingers together and we're looking for that little space between the fingers, that little diamond shaped space with light coming through it. And if we see that, that is completely normal. And if that space seems to have disappeared, then that is in keeping with finger clubbing, right? So that is one way to assess the nail angle at the bedside. Now, if you're pretty confident that the nail angle is normal when you do Shamroth sign, you could probably just stop there, right? But if you're unsure, if it's a little bit subtle, and maybe you're thinking, is that angle normal? Like, is it? I, I mean, I don't know. Um, then you might want to take the patient's finger and check for something known as the hyponychial angle. Now, what even is a hyponychium? I don't know about you, but at med school, I completely lost the memo and I didn't know what that was. <laughs> so the hyponychium is this little piece of skin. At the bottom of the nail, we have the cuticle, which is a lot more intuitive. And then the skin under the nail is known as the hyponychium. So to assess the hyponychial angle, I want you to look at your finger side on. I want you to draw two imaginary lines. The first one goes from the DIP joint to the cuticle, and the second goes from the cuticle to the hyponychium, the skin just under the top of the nail. Now, in truth, I find this easier to do with the help of a flat edge, like a ruler or a pen, where I draw the first line and then feel where I have to tilt that flat surface in order to make the second line. Now, you're not gonna find that part in a clinical exam book or a medical text, 
that is just something I developed for myself whilst making this video and I just find it a lot easier. So I wanted to share it with you. I think that visually assessing this angle from the side is probably good enough in your clinical exam. You know, in studies, they actually do it with like measuring the actual angle. <laughs> We're not gonna do that in a clinical exam. The examiners aren't gonna do that. But I find that that flat edge just helps me to keep track of where those two lines are and the angles that are between them. So play around with this, see what suits you in terms of drawing those lines in your mind. But if you just look from the side, that's probably gonna be roughly enough and use your imagination. And in drawing these two lines, we have just created an angle, right? And that angle Angle is the hypernicule angle. A normal hypernicule angle is less than a straight line typically, so less than 180 degrees, but normal is actually defined as less than 192 degrees. So if it goes just a little bit beyond a straight line, it could still be regarded as normal, but if it goes beyond 192 degrees, we're thinking that is the definition of clubbing, okay? Lock that in for me. So two ways to assess for that angle. We've got Shamroth sign and we've got the hypernicule angle. You could do both of them in your short case. It really doesn't take that long. Remember to make a big scene of it. So that's the angles, right? And we know from the stages of clubbing that after the nail angle changes, there's more, right? The whole fingertip can change, right? <laughs> so now we're gonna look at that. We're gonna look at the finger side on. We're gonna examine this up and down ways or the depth of the finger. And to do this, we're gonna use another two imaginary lines, one at the distal interphalangeal joint and the other below the cuticle. And what's normal is that the finger should taper, right? The depth of the finger at the cuticle should be less than the depth at the DIP joint. And if that's not the case, then that is a sign of clubbing. And this is called the phalangeal depth ratio. Now, the proper way to do this is to use calipers and actually measure it and divide the depth at the fingernail by the depth at the DIP joint and if the ratio is greater than one that means clubbing. Now I have never seen this done <laughs> in the exam. The examiners do not have calipers, they are not doing this so I would say that you do not have to do this but if you did have a case where you're thinking this could be clubbing, the angle looks a bit funny, maybe just have a look at that, the depth of the finger and just decide what you think if it's in keeping with clubbing or not. And that way, if you've done all of those things and it is potentially subtle clubbing, when you come back to discuss your findings with the examiner, you're gonna feel more confident about your findings because you'll have made a decision either way. And you'll also be able to justify your thoughts as to why you think there is clubbing or not or whether it's subtle, okay? So it's just to give you a few more things in the toolbox so you can look the examiner in the eye and boss that discussion, okay? Now, if you do find clubbing in the fingers, the examiners love it when you look at the toes as well. So if you find bilateral clubbing in the hands, the toes are something you're supposed to look at. So <laughs> after the exam, wherever you are in the cardio respiratory, you usually go to the feet anyway. If you're going down to the feet, be sure to look at those nails as well. Probably not a good place for Shamrock sign unless your patient is a contortionist. So we're just talking about having a look at the nail angles down there seeing if there's anything obvious. So that is you officially equipped to look for even the most subtle signs of clubbing at the bedside. Too easy. But when we find finger clubbing, we must consider the cause. And I don't know about you, but I find that hard to memorize. I've tried so many times, it just falls right out of my head. So we are going to commit the causes of clubbing to memory. And there are a couple of ways to do this. So I've seen other people teach this and um, really excellent people teaching this with mnemonics. I'm sure if you Google it, you can find this mnemonic here for clubbing. It's a vibe if you like that and if you can retrieve that. But what I find personally is that in the clinical exam, this mnemonic might not be so helpful because we wanna be able to retrieve the causes of clubbing by body system, right? So we can discuss the system that we're in usually. And my brain finds it a lot clunkier when I'm nervous to try and be like, right, what does C stand for? And L and U and, <laughs> right? I just, my, my neural pathways are not fast when it comes to this type of learning. But I tend to work in pictures, right? So I can retrieve a mind map way easier than I can retrieve a mnemonic. So I want you to just take what you need here, take which one you like, but I'm going to show you my favorite way at what I think is the best way of memorizing finger clubbing for your clinical exam purposes. And that is to think in pictures. So grab a pen and paper and let's draw this out together. Now, as we draw this out, I want you to create a little character. I'm going to call mine Jimmy and Jimmy is in the club. Love in this club, in this club. In this club. So Jimmy is in the club and he's got his hands up in the air. 
and in his hands we see clubbing, okay? <laughs> and now we're like, what are the causes of clubbing? Let's look inside Jimmy, okay? Let's suss this out. Let's start with the lung. Inside the lungs, we have a few possibilities. Number one is cancer, right? Any type of lung cancer. We've got suppurative lung disease and infections. Anything mucus and pus related could do this. Bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, a lung abscess, also tuberculosis, fungal infections that could do this. And interestingly, clubbing in cystic fibrosis has actually been associated with the severity of lung disease and was more common in those who had a lower FEB1, around 45%, as opposed to those with a higher FEB1 of 70% or so. So you can have someone with cystic fibrosis who doesn't have clubbing, but clubbing tends to suggest the more advanced lung disease in this group. Good to know. And lastly, we have this scar here, which represents idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So that's your lung causes. Now, there are two more things that you need to know about when it comes to the lung causes of clubbing. First of all, let's answer that question we asked at the start of this video, which pulmonary condition is not associated with finger clubbing? And the answer is COPD. If you see a patient with COPD and finger clubbing, it should absolutely spark investigation for an underlying cause including lung cancer, okay? Because they've often been a smoker, for example. So COPD and clubbing do not go together. Think harder if you see clubbing in these individuals. And the second thing you need to know here is the connection between finger clubbing and another examination finding that you look for in the respiratory exam. And that is HPOA, hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy. So you know when you're in your respiratory exam and you palpate the wrists, perhaps somewhat tokenistically because the clinical exam book told you to do it. Well, what we are doing there is we're looking for something called HPOA, which is when we feel the wrist for any sort of heat, tenderness, hot, painful, swollen joints, basically. Now, it's not actually the joint itself that's causing that. It's inflammation of the bone, um, periostitis, basically. And it doesn't only happen at the wrist. It could happen around the ankles, too. And the reason we look for HPOA in the respiratory exam is because of its association with lung cancer and pleural lesions, even lymphoma, right? So bad things. And in an article that I read from the 1960s, it said that around 2% of people with lung cancer may have that clinical sign. But HPOA does not come alone, right? It comes with finger clubbing. And the finger clubbing happens before the HPOA. Boom. Boom. So what I'm saying here is, if you are in your respiratory exam and you see clubbing, you wanna also check for HPOA. Now, if you did come across suspected HPOA clinically, be aware that that is actually a diagnosis that requires imaging. So you need to do an X-ray or a bone scan to confirm your suspicions. But if you feel those hot tender wrists and this clubbing, those things go together and you wanna synthesize that into the possibility of lung cancer, okay? So let's move on from the lungs and head on over to the heart. Here, there are basically two things that we need to commit to memory. Cyanotic congenital heart disease, as represented by this blue heart, and infective endocarditis, as represented by this bacterial ball. So of course, we could assess Jimmy, who is in the club, for the features of those conditions. Now, moving down to the gastrointestinal system, we have cirrhosis, especially primary biliary cirrhosis or juvenile cirrhosis, inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease. And then coming up to the thyroid, we have thyroid acropachy, which is a term used to describe a triad of signs that happen exclusively in Graves' disease of the thyroid, right? So the hyperthyroidism situation, graves, autoimmune. This includes clubbing, but also soft tissue swelling of the hands and feet and new bone formation in the extremities. Okay, so we've got kind of thickening of the digits as well, potentially. So those are the key differentials to work through in your mind. Those would be the most common. There are, of course, more causes, small print things like neurogenic tumors of the diaphragm, HIV, you might have an infected vascular graft, pulmonary AV malformations, and there's likely so many more. But for the purpose of your clinical exam, if you have a patient with clubbing and you can work through this diagram and focus 
in on a particular system and talk about the clinical signs that you found or did not find that would help to rule in or rule out or maybe the investigations that you might do to explore that then that's really what you need for your clinical exam not all the rare weird wonderful things okay just take the examiner on a journey and use this as your roadmap were there any clinical signs to support these differentials or how might you explore that? That's what the examiner is looking for. So I find this way, thinking of a diagram, my brain works. I can, when asked about clubbing, I can retrieve Jimmy in the club and then go inside Jimmy and get this. So if your brain works a bit like that, you might find this um, a way easier system. So take what you need, decide what you're going to do, but whatever you do, you're going to have to memorize the causes of clubbing before this exam. So get on it, people. <laughs> I should also just say here that everything I've just said is about bilateral clubbing. If you had unilateral clubbing, you'd want to think about problems just in the arterial supply of that arm, maybe an aneurysm that's flicking off little mini clots, something like that. Okay, so think about the arterial supply and whether that's normal, but if it's bilateral, these are your causes. So there you have it, clubbing unpacked for all of the different exams you're going to do, all of your short cases, in a way that I hope you never forget. So I hope you've enjoyed this video and I would be so grateful if you would hit that like button and share it with a study buddy that you think might benefit. And if you are studying for your clinical exam, be sure to check out our clinical exam playlist. You're going to need them. They're great. All right, Dr. Humans, thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you again soon for some more high yield learning. <laughs> Bye.